Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Austin and Bird weekly webinar series, Making the Most of Tax Reform. Today's session is covering Section 163J. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Scott Hardy. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for dialing in. Uh, this morning, my name is Scott Hardy, and I'm a, a partner in the Federal and International Tax Group here at Austin and Bird. And I'm joined this morning by Jack Cummings, who's a counsel in our group. Um, before we get started, I wanted to give a quick um, just overview of this series and uh, the plan for the next eight to ten weeks. Um, in, in late 2017, as the tax reform legislation was moving through Congress, we started a series to discuss, walk through the components of the legislation and the progression of the legislation through Congress. And then once the bill passed, um, we thought it would be helpful to hold weekly updates um, just to discuss various aspects of the law and drill down a bit more into some of the issues it raised for our clients. Um, and then late last year, November, December, the IRS began releasing proposed regulations in connection with the TCJA. And um, many of these were eagerly anticipated, um, but the IRS has released uh, a lot of regulations in various areas, so there's uh, a great deal uh, to digest. So given kind of this influx of new regulations, we thought it would be good to revisit uh, our series and provide uh, summaries of the regulations uh, for our clients. So there's a, there's a lot of topics for us to um, cover, and right now we, we have eight uh, weekly updates scheduled and, and anticipate that we're going to have a few more to add, so uh, stay tuned for that, but we have eight already. Um, this week, we're going to begin with uh, 163J and the new limitation on uh, the deductibility of interest, and then next week we were gonna we will be discussing the prospects for uh, technical corrections in the new Congress. Um, and given the need for quite a few corrections to the TCJ, um, some of which Jack is going to touch on today, um, that should be an informative session. So hopefully you can join us next week as well. So um, just a quick note: these are obviously very lengthy, very complex. Um, regulation packages, and our goal is to provide just an overview of, of what's been released and spot issues that may be of interest. So as we go through the presentation, if you have questions, please submit them at any time. You can submit a question whenever you want. Just type it into the uh, ask a question box on your screen, and we will uh, try to answer those during the call or at the end. Um, so we're going to do our best to stay on time uh, to our 30-minute time slot, and uh, we, there's a chance we might go over, but hopefully we will not. Um, and given that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so let me just uh, do a quick introduction for Jack, who may need no introduction, but Jack is counsel in our Raleigh and D.C. Office, offices, and he's served as um, associate chief counsel of the corporate division at the IRS, and he's a former chair of the corporate tax committee of the ABA and a prolific author. And uh, most notably, Jack remembers a time when interest was fully deductible. So um, let me uh, turn it over to Jack. Good morning. As Scott said, uh, interest uh, once was completely deductible for all taxpayers. Uh, there's been increasing uh, disallowance of interest over the last 30 to 40 years, uh, bringing us to where we are today. Uh, you might wonder why, why is it that interest among uh, all the other deductions has become so encrusted with, um, with limitations, and, the, and there are several good reasons. First, it's easy to multiply interest. Uh, any of you who are in multi, uh, corporate groups with multiple entities know that it's very common for one entity to borrow and lend to another, and then uh, the one that gets the note of the borrower can, you know, distribute or contribute that note to another mem member of the group, which now becomes a creditor, et cetera, et cetera. So interest can multiply like rabbits amongst uh, taxpayers that are related. Uh, second, it's also possible to, uh, from the IRS's standpoint, to increase the amount of interest uh, beyond uh, maybe the market rate. And peculiarly enough, the OID rules, which were installed in the 1980s, uh, go to a great lengths to uh, create interest uh, for people who are trying to avoid having interest, and they don't work so well when taxpayers have overstated interest. 
So that's the second reason why there's, there are other limitations on interest. A third reason is that often uh, the, uh, the concept of allowing a deduction to one taxpayer may be okay because the taxpayer on the other end of the transaction will report income. As we all know, that doesn't always work so well for interest since many lenders are offshore, don't pay tax, et cetera. Also, interest can be used to finance property that does not produce uh, taxable income or income that's taxable at ordinary rates. So there are lots of reasons why interest is particularly disfavored in the code. Old Section 163J was specifically aimed at outbound interest, and as we know, New, 60, new Section 163J is aimed at all interest. The first question will be, well, who cares about this new limitation? But potentially all taxpayers who pay business interest, and underline the word business, business interest, may care except those who lucky folk who uh, sell vehicles and note that vehicles are not just automobiles. So if you're interested in quote, full plan financing interest, feel free to drill down on that in the statute and regulations because it, it can be fairly expansive. Or you may not care if you're an accepted industry, which are farming, utilities, and real estate. But the escape hatch for most business taxpayers will be the so-called small business exception, which applies to a taxpayer that has no more than 25 million average gross receipts over the preceding three years. Uh, the problem with the 25 million gross receipts uh, threshold is that it will be applied on an aggregate basis and can drag that in a lot of taxpayers that are related that you might uh, not expect would be combined with, with you. Uh, for example, uh, a taxpayer usually is going to have to aggregate the gross receipts of any, tax, any partnership uh, of which it owns more than a half, and you might say, well, I don't own half of many partnerships, but the half ownership is, is determined with attribution, which can often produce strange results. Also, members of, of course, consolidated groups and control groups of corporations will be aggregated for the 25% of uh, 25 million threshold. Uh, if you can't get out of the rule through the small business exception, the, the second and, and, and main other remaining way out is to not pay interest that exceeds the permitted deduction amount. And the permitted deduction amount is the so-called basic limit that taxpayers are, who are not exempt can deduct their business interest up to 30% of their adjusted taxable income, which is a term used in the statute, comma, plus their full plan financing interest, if you have any, comma, plus their business interest income. A problem here is that the aggregation rules that we just discussed that can be applied for purposes of uh, of uh, putting a taxpayer outside of the 25 million uh, average gross receipts threshold and, and putting the taxpayer into the rule. Those aggregation rules do not apply to pull related taxpayers' income into the adjusted gross, excuse me, into the adjusted taxable income amount. So you can be, you, a taxpayer, can be in the limit by virtue of aggregation, but the, the related um, party's uh, taxable income doesn't count to increase your ATI. Another surprising way that some taxpayers may become subject to the rules is the so-called uh, tax shelter exception. The tax shelter is, is, is defined in a very unusual way, uh, and it can apply if um, limited partners are allocated 35% uh, or more of a partnership's losses, which can happen uh, in many real estate uh, partnerships. So that's um, the second way to become automatically subject to the limitations. So again, under the, the, the heading of who cares, uh, there are obviously going to be three categories of taxpayers that, that may care. Uh, back to individuals, if you represent individuals and you're um, running this uh, 25 million gross receipts threshold analysis, you need to know that W-2 compensation 
and certain other personal income items are excluded from gross receipts, which is good uh, for purposes of the 25 million threshold, but a 1099 income and investment income counts. Also notice that investment interest expense of an individual is not subject to the 163J limit, but is subject to its own limit in 163D. If you represent C-Corps, you need to know that all interest expense paid by the C-Corp will be treated as business interest. There's no investment category for C-Corps and therefore potentially subject to the limit. Also, all income of the C-Corp will count for the gross receipts threshold. If you represent partnerships and S-Corporations, you need to know that the deduction limit applies at the entity level and all receipts will count for the purposes of the 25 million gross receipts threshold. Real estate and farming businesses can elect out, and obviously the real estate industry is very interested in this possibility. The election is an irrevocable option for the farming and real estate businesses. Utilities are automatically out. A taxpayer can may have multiple businesses, uh, some of which may be accepted, for example, some of which may be utilities or real estate businesses and others not. This will be fairly common in consolidated groups. Uh, electing out, uh, particularly for real estate businesses, will have the downside of requiring the, the business that elects out to convert to the alternate depreciation system, which is basically a slower method of depreciation. It also precludes use of the new 100% bonus depreciation for new newly purchased properties. So taxpayers, particularly a real estate business that elects out, must convert to uh, from so-called maker's depreciation on existing property to the alternate depreciation method. There's been a lot of chatter about the fact about how this will apply to so-called qualified improvement property, which is a particular category of depreciable property. Currently, under the uh, 2017 law as written, the qualified improvement property is not eligible for bonus depreciation, but there's a strong move to seek a change in the law to make it eligible for bonus depreciation. In other words, 100% immediate write-off. If the law is changed, and a real estate business has elected out of 163J, then it will lose the potential for bonus depreciation on newly purchased qualified improvement property. So this has, is producing a real <clears throat> conundrum for real estate businesses that either might or might not like to elect out of 163J. The Proposed regulations uh, have provided clarity for what is a real estate business that may elect out, and, and, a, and a real estate business may be one involved in either real estate operations or real estate management. When the taxpayer operates the business, the real estate business, then it needs to own the business, and it must own the real estate and it must earn money from the real estate and not in the real estate. For example, a restaurant business that owns its own real property is not in the real estate operation business. It's in the restaurant business and so it could not elect out. On the other hand, a hotel uh, generally can elect out because it earns money from real property. Uh, when a taxpayer manages real property, it also may be an electing business, uh, easier to elect out, but that type of uh, taxpayer is not likely to have so much interest expense. A recent revenue procedure announced a special category of real estate operating businesses for, for what are called specified infrastructure arrangements that meet certain criteria. And um, this appears to be aimed at uh, like joint ventures or other businesses that are put together to uh, build infrastructure uh, and might not otherwise be characterized as real estate businesses. 
uh, query, again, how much interest expense those businesses would occur, but if they're borrowing to buy machinery and equipment, perhaps they would. If a taxpayer has both accepted and non-accepted businesses, for example, if it has utilities or real estate businesses and other businesses that incur interest expense, and, it, and it, the proposed regulations require that the taxpayer allocate its interest expense between its accepted and non-accepted businesses, and the allocation is to be done on the basis of the adjusted federal income tax basis of the assets used in the two types of businesses. Of course, using the alternative depreciation system, which, for example, a real estate business must, if it elects out, will produce a higher tax basis for the properties used and perhaps more exempted interest. Note that finding adjusted uh, tax basis is sometimes hard for taxpayers who tend to focus on a book value. The proposed regulations broadly define interest expense, and there has already been uh, a lot of speculation about whether Treasury has exceeded its authority. The, the proposals basically include three types of, of uh, expenses in interest. One is any payment that would be treated as interest generally for purposes of the income tax, which is itself a very broad definition. Two, other payments that, that various specific code rules treat as interest and that would not otherwise look like interest. And then three, other payments that either function like interest or offset the cost of borrowing. And the offsetting of the cost of borrowing is particularly concerning to some taxpayers. For example, given in the proposed regulations, a loss on a short sale of gold would, could be an interest expense or substitute interest expense uh, paid on, uh, by uh, short sellers of, uh, of debt securities. Uh, whether guarantee fees will be treated as interest expense because they offset the cost of borrowing is, uh, is not entirely clear. However, uh, lease expenses under a true lease uh, should not be interest. Also, capitalized interest is not limited under 163J, only deducted interest. Now recall that we said that this term adjusted taxable income or ATI, uh, of which uh, any taxpayer can deduct um, its interest up to 30% of its ATI is gonna be the primary out for most taxpayers not otherwise excluded. So if you want, um, so you want your ATI to be larger, but again, it is limited to your one taxpayer's ATI or the ATI of a consolidated group. Adjusted taxable income is computed by starting with taxable income and making certain adjustments. First, all partnership items flowing up to a partner are stripped out. Uh, items related to accepted and non-business uh, 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 activities of the taxpayer are stripped out. Before 2020, depreciation and amortization is stripped out, meaning obviously ATI will be bigger. And uh, so far, th this is what has kept uh, a lot of taxpayers from being concerned about 163J, but when, when the law changes in 2022, there will be a significantly greater potential impact of the section. And the proposed regulations clarify that depreciation will not be removed from cost of goods sold before 2020, meaning that ATI will be smaller, which is a bad thing. Um, adjusted taxable income that a that's 30% of which is greater than uh, the taxpayer's business expense business expense will not carry over, so it's, it's a one and done uh, item for taxpayers, except for partnerships, as we'll discuss in a minute. 
Taxpayers can also increase their interest deduction capacity by earning business interest income. Their interest expense is deductible on up to 30% of their ATI, their full plan financing interest and business interest income. This is not gonna help many taxpayers except banks and financial institutions which have their own sort of special regime here uh, unless the taxpayer um, uh, is in the uh, business of financing sales from inventory. Uh, of course, all interest earned by any C Corp will be business interest income, so that will tend to pump up that amount. And uh, as mentioned before, the cross border and foreign intergroup loans often tend to produce offsetting interest amounts, which, which can, can help in those in instances. Note that the broad definition of interest for, that we discussed a minute ago generally also applies on the income side as well as the expense side. And therefore, it can be helpful if the taxpayer earns, uh, say, the guarantee fees that, that might turn out to be treated as uh, uh, interest expense on the payer side. Next, we will turn briefly to what I call the partnership morass. Uh, because this is by far the most uh, complex and lengthy part of the regulations and of the statute. The 163J limit applies at the partnership level to the interest expense of the partnership. Uh, I want to emphasize that the rules uh, of the statute are so complex that the Treasury in the Joint Committee Blue Book, which is the Joint Committee's summary of the 2017 Act that was uh, released in December, disagree over what the statute means on an important uh, sub-issue relating to partnerships. And a substantial rewrite of the partnership part of 163J has already been proposed in the technical correction bill that was introduced uh, pretty much on the last day of the last Congress. Any partnership that thinks it might be subject to the 163J limit should give a lot of thought to, uh, to what it's going to do. Uh, it, it might avoid the limit by combining with a related partnership that maybe has a lot of ATI. Um, it, the owners of the partners might consider rearranging uh, partnership structures so that partnerships are, uh, you know, in a parent-sub relationship rather than a brother-sister relationship, or uh, the partners might consider incorporating the partnership if C Corp status is desirable for other reasons, such as, for example, the 21% tax rate newly applicable to C Corps. Uh, we know that at least two well-known uh, publicly traded partnerships have incorporated uh, in part because of 163J, but primarily because uh, they discovered that the market discounted uh, the value of publicly traded partnerships. Uh, and that's occurred in the last six months. Secondly, we've seen some uh, private equity uh, partnerships incorporate uh, although it's harder to uh, get get data on exactly how many have done so. As I indicated, about half of the complications of the section relate to partnerships. And it's obviously not possible to cover them here, but I do want to focus on the one point, and this is the point that the uh, Joint Committee disagreed with the Treasury in its proposed regulations, and it is this. The most important aspect of the partnership rules is the degree to which excess business interest expense, which is acronym EBIE, excess business interest expense of the partnership, and that's interest of the partnership that's disallowed to the partnership for a year. The degree to which that EBIE can be deducted in a later year by the partners, and then secondly, the degree to which 
the partnership's excess taxable income, ETI, and that is sort of the partnership's own adjustable taxable income headroom uh, after allowing all of its own interest to be deduction to be deducted. The extent to which those two items can be used in a later year of the partner to increase the partner's interest deduction limit in addition to their uh, in addition also to the fact that they will tear up to them excess partnership business interest income. So that's that's three moving parts that can that can move from the partnership to the partner uh, in a year and come into play in the partnership's later year. Now let's unpack that a little bit. The proposed regulation says that a partner in a later year can treat as its own interest expense, in other words, as if it paid interest in the later year, equal to its share of EBIE of the partnership in a prior year that carries over, comma, to the extent of the partner's share of the of partnership excess business interest income and the partnership's excess taxable income in the later year. Also, the partner will add the partnership's excess taxable income in the later year to the partner's own ATI in the later year. I'll give you just one example. Let's say a partnership in year one had disallowed interest of $200 and one partner, 50-50 partner, was allowed $100 of the excess business interest expense. Now, that just sits with the partner. He doesn't, can't do anything with it that year. In year two, let's say the partnership has $200 of excess taxable income, which is excess deduction headroom, and the partner share, again, is 100 Therefore, the statute says the partner can treat himself as paying $100 of interest expense in year two. Well, fine. Okay, so his partner's got $100 of potentially deductible interest expense in year two. What can he do with it? Well, the partner has to apply 163J to his interest expense in the later year. Assume it's only that $100 carryover partnership interest expense. So in that second year, the $100 ETI earned by the partner ship in the second year is added to the partner's ATI. Let's assume he has none of his own. So now he's got 100 ATI. Fine. So in the second year, he can deduct 30% of 100 equal $30. Of the $100 of excess business interest income he carried over from year one. Well, how much good was that? He got to carry over $100 of potentially deductible partnership interest, but he only is allowed to deduct 30. That's, that's kind of crummy. But suppose the partner has a bunch of income of his own in year two. Let's uh, pick a number. Let's say $233 of his own ATI in year two. Now, 30% times 233 will allow him to deduct the other $70 of the partnership's EBIE from year one. That's a pretty good result, but the joint, and the proposed regulation allows it, but the joint committee disagrees and says no, largely based on the legislative history. So we'll see how that works out, but presumably Treasury will stick with its proposed regulation. Consolidated groups will be the taxpayers mostly concerned with 163J because they're mostly the ones with the big interest expense. The uh, consolidated group will compute its limit on a consolidated basis. Uh, that doesn't, it's not as simple as it looks. It doesn't mean that you just ignore all intercompany uh, interest, but the bottom line is only net interest paid outside the group will be subject to limitation. And there's a very convoluted uh, way to figure that out. 
if a member of a consolidated group with suspended interest expenses leaves the group and joins another group, that suspended interest expense will be subject to special limitations called the, quote, Surly Rules uh, in, in, the, in the new group. Foreign corporations are subject to the limitation uh, if they are, quote, applicable CFCs, applicable control of foreign corporations. And this is pretty much any CFC as determined under the new surprising rule of the 2017 Act, which vastly expanded the number of foreign corporations that are treated as CFCs, but only if there's some 10% United States shareholder uh, to whom would be allocated subpart F income from the CFC. The only good thing here is that, tax, is that the U.S. shareholders can irrevocably elect to compute the limit on a CFC group basis, which is going to operate sort of like the same rules for uh, consolidated uh, corporations. Um, before 2018, a U.S. parent that had CFCs might arrange its borrowing so that it would borrow in the United States and deduct the interest against 35% taxed income and uh, lend the money to its uh, CFCs or, or contribute it to the CFCs as a capital contribution. Now that that U.S. parent will be paying tax at a 21% rate, it uh, might find that domestic borrowing is less attractive and might choose to therefore to reorganize where borrowing occurs in the group. Um, of course, domestic groups of corporations may be owned by foreign parents. And in those situations, it was very common for the foreign parent to lend into the United States and have the U.S. affiliates pay outbound interest, often at you know higher rates of interest than the foreign parent might have paid to the bank. Uh, this is going to be much less likely to occur, and a, and a lot of uh, foreign-owned domestic corporations have been reorganizing their borrowing because that outbound interest now can be subject not only to 163J, but it can be subject to the base erosion tax called the BEAT. And these two limits have already caused many large groups to restructure so that uh, the domestic entities will bar directly from the bank. And if it's if their interest is subject to 163J, so be it. Uh, but at least they're not subject to the beat because they're not paying the uh, interest outbound to a related borrower. Um, other scenarios of interest in addition to the inbound and outbound interest uh, payments will be uh, uh, highly leveraged taxpayers, obviously uh, potentially uh, largely concerned with 163J. Uh, capital structure changes might be possible. There's been talk about shifting to preferred stock, but we really haven't seen much of that yet. I've already indicated that owners of multiple partnerships may seek to combine and reorganize their partnerships if they are subject to the limit. Uh, C corporations uh, may be substituted for partnerships. Uh, groups of corporations will need to reevaluate their own lending practices. I've already mentioned, you know, the own lending that has been used in the past by both foreign and domestic parents of groups. And there will be a lot of consideration about whether to put debt into controlled foreign corporations or not, which under the new act has a lot of other uh, implications in addition to 163J, particularly the so-called guilty tax. Finally, these proposed regulations uh, are not applicable to the 2018 year, um, and many will be wondering whether they should rely on them. The uh, proposal specifically says that taxpayers may rely on them for 2018, but must uh, do so, uh, both the taxpayer and related parties must do so, quote, consistently. It's not clear what consistently means, but uh, if you have any uh you know, thought about uh, choosing to uh, rely on a certain part of the proposed regulations, you should consider that very carefully. In conclusion, 
163J may not have wide application, unlike, for example, guilty, which is going to apply essentially to every <laughs> controlled foreign corporation in, uh, you know, owned by United States shareholders. 163J will have considerably lesser application, maybe to only, you know, five to ten percent of publicly traded companies in any particular year. But when it does apply, it will be serious. And uh, those uh, applicable taxpayers will have to consider uh, uh, these potential changes that we've uh, already discussed. Scott, that's it. Do we have any questions? Um, yeah, no, no, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think right now um, we don't have any questions. We will have these slides available. So if, um, uh, if you would like them, we will have those posted and available for download. Um, thank you, Jack, for that presentation. Sorry, we, we did go a little bit long, but that was a very helpful summary. Um, I think raising a lot of potential issues with the BEAT and CFCs and partnerships, and then yeah, maybe a, 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 we might have a separate call just on the, the general authority to issue these regulations and whether the IRS has exceeded it. That's an interesting um, issue. Um, so everyone, thank you for joining. Uh, next week, I uh, hope you can join us for the discussion on the prospect for technical corrections. Um, it'll be next uh, Tuesday at 11 a.m., and uh, we look forward to uh, talking with you then. Thanks very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's discussion. We appreciate your participation.